Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation, or any part thereof, is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Novo Nordisk. Hello, I'm Melanie Davies, Professor of Diabetes Medicine at the University of Leicester and at University Hospitals Leicester NHS Trust in the UK. So welcome to this program titled COVID-19 Pandemic Implications uh, for Diabetes Care. Joining me today is Eskild Peterson from the University of Aarhus in Denmark and co-chair of the European Society for Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases Emerging Infections Task Force. Welcome Eskild. Thank you very much. So we're really in unprecedented situation at the moment with COVID-19. Um, it's bringing new challenges, new ways of working, and it's a particular risk for uh, people with diabetes. And it certainly presents um, a whole new paradigm uh, for diabetologists and endocrinologists uh, working in the field. And we've always been used to working in as a multidisciplinary team, but now we really need uh, the help and support of our infectious diseases colleagues to really understand this challenge uh, that we face at the moment and the implication it has for people with diabetes. So in this program, we're going to try and pick out some of those challenges and uh, try and uh, present some practical guidance. So Eskild, I'd like to start with you to really give us um, some uh, insight into what COVID-19 means and why you think that people with diabetes are at higher risk and what you think that risk is. Well, um, I think the short answer is that uh, we don't know. Uh, this is a, a new infection, uh, which we have not seen before, and uh, it behaves very different from uh, other coronaviruses we have uh, met over the past 20 years, like SARS and MERS, in that it's much more infectious. It, uh, it really uh, results in a lot of people uh, needing uh, ventilator uh, care. <clears throat> what what is happening apparently, which is very different from uh, influenza, which everybody is thinking about when, they, uh, when you have a pandemic of a respiratory tract infection, is that uh, you, you, you have two phases. And the first phase is when you get infected and the virus uh, are replicating in your respiratory tract and your immune system is uh, battling the virus. And then after four or five days, the immune system gets the upper hand and, uh, and you are cured. But in some cases, the immune system sort of um, go weird and uh, you get an aberrant uh, immune response where the immune system is... Uh, is overreacting and that means that you get an overreacting inflammatory response and that is the second phase that you see in uh, in patients who move into intensive care or need oxygen care without going into intensive care but at that time the virus has actually disappeared and uh, and uh, if you're going to treat the virus with antivirals you have to treat it early but when you have the um, <clears throat> overreaction from the immune system the antivirals will most probably have no effect. So this is what we are, what we are up, up against. And this is what we have learned over the past uh, three months, that this is how this virus uh, behave. And uh, I think it's fair to say that we do not understand why, but, um, but this is how it is. And this uh, marker of inflammation and this hypercoagulable state is, is quite a marked feature, I think, that many of us, uh, certainly outside of the field, didn't realise was such an issue. 
when you have an activation of the inflammatory system, you will have a high C-reactive protein, you can have a high white blood cell count. Uh, what has been one of the key markers here is the IL-6, but if you measure other interleukins, they will also be ele elevated. You also have a kind of a hyper coagulopathy, and uh, this is what you also see in some cases of bacterial septicemia, that you get microthrombosis, you can get pulmonary embolism, and uh, the connection between the inflammatory response and uh, the coagulopathy is, is definitely not my uh, field of expertise, but, but as a clinician, you will have to watch out for it. And when we come to this risk with people with diabetes, we know from the early Chinese data um, that that was, you know, the field's changing so quickly, it's difficult to keep up with all of the data, but certainly data that was published in, in February um, showed a high risk, particularly in older patients, but also those with comorbidities, particularly cardiovascular comorbidities, but diabetes. And we know that um, uh, the, the case for fatality was higher in people with diabetes. So it was around 2% uh, overall, but nearly threefold higher uh, in those uh, with diabetes. And, and we know that the percentage of people uh, who had diabetes who also had COVID um, was anything from seven to 20%. I think as the, as the data has been emerging and we've seen data come from Europe, particularly uh, Europe and North America and, and the US and, and Italy, uh, we know that the percentage of people with diabetes is around uh, one in seven, so around uh, uh, 14%. And I think second only to hypertension um, as a comorbidity. And we also know that uh, people with diabetes likely to get more severe form of COVID-19. And unfortunately, and very sadly, they have um, a, a higher risk um, a, of dying. So I don't know, Eskild, any uh, comments on, on the particular risk that we see uh, in people with diabetes? Well, <clears throat> I'm not surprised because if you look at all kinds of infections, then uh, people with diabetes has a higher risk, um, no matter whether we are looking at uh, bacterial infection, tuberculosis, and, and, and so on. So there's a, a general impaired immune reactivity in people with diabetes. So they are more prone to getting complicated infections, and therefore it is perhaps a surprise that it's so much with, with COVID, but on the other hand, they they are immunocompromised. Uh, and uh, there's been many studies looking at why are diabetic people immunocompromised. And uh, I think it's fair to, to say that uh, there's not a single answer, but uh, it seems that your cellular immunity in some way, your T lymphocytes are not working as well as they should be and there's also been some studies indicating that your T lymphocytes uh, may overreact in their immune reactivity secreting cytokines when they really shouldn't do it. Um, why it is so I don't think anybody knows that and then your question would be can I prevent that by regulating my diabetes and my answer again is I don't know, but um, this is what you can do. And, uh, and uh, I think that uh, if you have a good regulated uh, diabetes, your risk of uh, experiencing a, uh, these problems are much less than if you have a dysregulated diabetes. So I think, as you pointed out, that even before COVID, we knew that people who um, uh, were much more likely to suffer from severe infections if they had diabetes, and that seemed to equate, uh, equate to both type 1 and type 2. We've got um, anecdotal reports of people having much poorer control and require much higher levels of insulin when they're in patients. And there's this data now that's coming out of the US that's just been published showing indeed that people with higher and poorer controlled diabetes seem to do worse in terms of both their mortality rate, but also their length of stay. And I suppose it, from a practical point of view, it, it, you know, it's an important message to people with diabetes to try and, uh, and, and healthcare professionals to try and improve their control. But actually when they're in hospital, we may need to do some work about trying to manage the hyperglycemia during the inpatient stay uh, to try and um, uh, improve things. 
So Eskild, are there any other reasons? I think you've gone through the immunocompromised situation um, in terms of people with diabetes. Is there anything else you wanted to elaborate around that in terms of the uh, susceptibility with people with diabetes? Well, one of the things that uh, happens when you have an inflammatory response is that your body is secreting more corticosteroids. <clears throat> and uh, we know that corticosteroids is definitely diabetogenic. Uh, just have somebody who for some reason need a dose of prednisolone and uh, you know that if they are diabetic, you, you have to adjust the uh, insulin. Uh, or if they are type 2, you may have to supplement with insulin during the phase where you give corticosteroids and it doesn't really matter whether it's uh, uh, your own body that makes the, uh, the steroids or whether you uh, you give it as a, as a supplement. Uh, one of the treatments, especially in intensive care, if you move into the second hyper-inflammatory hyper phase of COVID is that the people would give you a pulse curse uh, course of uh, a pulse course of uh, methylprednisolone and that will definitely drive up your blood sugar and uh, impair your immune system even further but our intensive care colleagues they are they are quite good at handling this because this is well known to, to them it's not uh, restricted to COVID it's also something that happens if you have adult respiratory distress syndrome as part of a bacterial septicemia so so I think that my concern is more the long-term uh, immune incompetence that you have in diabetes and not the short-term uh, dysregulated diabetes you see in uh, intensive care hospitals because that is immediately monitored and uh, and uh, your physicians will immediately increase your insulin. So it's more the underlying long-term immunosuppression which is causing the higher morbidity and higher mortality that we are seeing in diabetes patients. So I think we're certainly in, in, in changing times and we've certainly had to, uh, to really think about how we change um, our practice and how we work on a, on a daily basis. So um, I think certainly for the, for the diabetologist, we're, we're working in a completely different way. Um, so certainly our role has changed and I think we're now um, having to think about how we keep people um, from falling ill. We have many people in the community uh, with diabetes and we have a, a role, I think, as diabetologists in, in, in trying to reduce the burden of them coming into hospital. I know, Eskild, that there's a lot of concern. We're focused on managing uh, COVID at the moment, but there's lots of concern around people with long-term conditions not coming to the hospital and maybe having a, um, a, an increased burden um, on their care in the future. I don't know if you wanted to have any comment about that. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure that I'm the right person to uh, to comment on it, but I think that you are absolutely right here that um, this illustrate that we have probably have to have a better outreach to our population with a chronic illness because what we could do or what we should have done was to have more prevention. We have to uh, prevent diabetes by lifestyle changes and that is always very, very difficult. But on the long run, this is what we can do to prevent uh, people uh, moving into a situation where they, uh, they have an increased risk of uh, all kinds of infections, in including COVID. So, so you're absolutely right. So as a diabetologist, we need to be really working with the community to try and uh, prevent people with diabetes falling ill and support people to uh, keep well during this sort of social distancing and so social isolation. But from a practical point of view, we now have many other people in the hospital trying to manage people with diabetes on the COVID wards, perhaps having to do insulin starts. So we, we have a role in educating and supporting those uh, inpatient teams and particularly those on the ICU in terms of helping them to manage uh, these patients with diabetes. Uh, but also to try and get them out of hospital um, as early as possible into a, a sort of safe environment and uh, providing education, often virtual education, to healthcare teams to help them uh, manage uh, diabetes because many of them may be unfamiliar and many of us are working in different roles um, than we were working before. 
So I think you raise an important point, and I think many um, diabetes services are really well integrated with primary care, and there's always been a big focus on, on prevention, primary prevention, and, and getting really good messages into schools and, and, and promoting lifestyle advice. But at this time, we need to do that even more, and we have to do it in a different way. We're now with the social distancing, and we're having to use virtual technology much more, so teleconferences. Um, there's been lots of fitness classes and, and mental health support classes that have been done online now. Um, and this message about people being careful of their lifestyle, I think at a time uh, when it's more difficult to uh, keep healthy and well, it's really important to emphasize that. On a practical note for people with diabetes, there are probably some really important messages around their medicines. So we know that um, it's really important to emphasize to our patients with diabetes and people with diabetes their sick day rules. And certainly in my service, we've been very proactive in getting in touch with people, um, uh, making sure that we run a helpline and video consultation. So we don't bring people routinely up into the outpatients. We're doing a lot more uh, video, video consultations, but specific advice around things like uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors, which it's really important to stop if people become um, unwell, um, but also the importance of maintaining good control of their diabetes and insulin adjustments. So there's some really important practical messages, I think, for people with diabetes and their medication. So firstly, it's important uh, for, the for the majority of medications to be continued as, as normal because it's important that we control hypertension, cholesterol levels and glucose levels during this time if people are perfectly well. There's been some debate about ACE inhibitors, but, but actually the data coming through is that it's, it's, it's safe and we should continue uh, ACE inhibitors in, in our patients with diabetes. Um, the issue becomes, I think, if people become unwell with COVID and they develop symptoms. And at that time, it's important to stop things like SGLT2 inhibitors. We have many patients with type 2 and also some people with type 1 on SGLT2 inhibitors. And if they become unwell and develop a fever, um, uh, it's really important with intercurrent illness to stop these medications. Um, and a uh, uh, particularly to stop them on admission to hospital. Also, um, we may need to increase other treatments. So for example, if people are unwell with COVID, they need to increase their um, insulin therapy. And it's really important that we update them around their sick day rules and that they have contact and, and numbers uh, to contact their, their, their diabetes support team. So we've had a really wide ranging discussion uh, today around COVID-19. Um, we've emphasized uh, how the diabetologists and endocrinologists are going to be um, learning more from infectious diseases consultants and, and collaborating. Um, we've talked about some of these new challenges that are, that are emerging. The data's changing so quickly, but we certainly know that people with diabetes are at increased risk of COVID. Uh, we know that they have a, a more, a more likely to have a severe illness and are unfortunately more likely to die. Um, you mentioned, I think, importantly, this challenge in the long term, both the immunosuppression leading to uh, a, an increased severe disease, but how we might want to look at that in the longer term. And we've discussed some of the practical implications of the role of the diabetologist and how that needs to change during these times and how we need to work quite differently and how it's going to be really important moving forward to talk about primary prevention and education and support of our patients. Thank you very much for joining uh, this session today. And uh, Elskid, thank you very much for the great discussion. Welcome.